Uh, welcome to CIPR seminar. Uh, it's, uh, it's really my great pleasure uh, to moderate uh, uh, this talk. Uh, let me introduce uh, our uh, speaker for today, uh, Professor Chong Zhen. I have been reading uh, Professor Chong's work for a long time, and this is really uh, great for me to have a chance to uh, moderate uh, her talk. Uh, professor Chung is an associate professor in the School of uh, Social Work at the University of Texas at Arlington. And she's a fellow of the Gerontology Society of America. Uh, she earned her PhD in uh, gerontology from School of Gerontology at University of Southern California. Uh, as you know, this is one of the top uh, programs of gerontology in America. Uh, she is currently uh, the associate editor of the Journal of Gerontology, uh, Social Sciences. Uh, uh, this is also the flagship uh, journal of uh, American Gerontological uh, Association. And uh, she's also the associate editor of Statistics for Psychological Trauma, Theory, Research, Practice, and Policy. She is serving on the editorial boards for the journals uh, of marriage and family and uh, research on, uh, on aging. Uh, her research uh, focused on older adults' social support and health in different uh, social and cultural contexts. Uh, now, uh, let us welcome Professor Chung. Thank you so much, Dr. Fong, for the uh, nice introduction. And thanks a lot to CFRP for inv uh, invitation uh, for me to be here and to share with you uh, some of my research. And I'm very happy. And uh, so I will uh, start from the title and let me share the screen now. Okay, and um, the topic is <coughs> older adults' vulnerability and resilience to disasters. I just want to talk a little bit about the background to this one. Uh, I, was, I was trained as a gerontologist, as Dr. Fong introduced. I graduated from the University of Southern California, the gerontology program. And when I was in the PhD program, I never expected that I will do some disaster-related research because my background is actually in, in intergenerational relationships and the family relationships and older adults well-being. But when I <coughs> became a faculty member at the Texas Tech University, there was a very famous National Wind Institute. National Wind Institute, especially they have a very large interdisciplinary program studying wind-related issues, especially about tornado. Do you know that tornado, they have been categorized by um, six categories from EF0 to EF5. EF5 is the most damaging and horrifying tornado. The EF0 is the, most, the slightest one. And that skill <coughs> was actually developed by the National Wind Institute. So it, they, they, they have a really strong team there. And uh, I was very fortunate uh, <coughs> to join them as their in-house social scientist. And started a conversation with a lot of people very interesting people from engineering, from atmospheric science, from a computer science, from biology. So we have <coughs> tried to have this kind of talk going on. That is, a <coughs> that is a you know the, the the time I started my research in tornado, and then I started to be interested in the more widely related things like disaster, in climate change. But my journey in this area started with tornado. So today I'm going to talk about three articles, um, all related to disasters and it, with a focus and a perspective from a gerontologist. Because, you know, disaster research, a lot of, in the disaster research, a lot of people recognize that older adults are vulnerable. When they, whenever they think about older adults, they think, oh, they are vulnerable. Yeah, they, they have, you know, they have limited functional limitations, they are frail and they are isolated. That is what they are thinking, but <clears throat> but that is what that's that's it. So a lot of our research just compare the younger adults and older adults, and then they stop there. But as the gerontologist, we just know that it is too limited, the very limited. You can you you know there are a lot of heterogeneities 
among older adults. And then there is almost no theory explaining older adults' you know, experiences, how they prepare, how they cope with, how they um, <coughs> respond and how they recover from disaster. So I think there's a, there's a huge gap that as a gerontologist, I can, I can fill. So I started that part and I started to work on that. And then um, I started to, um, <coughs> in the year 2011, there was two huge tornadoes in the United States. One is a dropping EF5 tornado. Another is um, EF4 tornado in Tascosa. That was the, <coughs> the, those two tornadoes are the two most expensive tornadoes, costly tornadoes so far in the, in the United history. And so that is formally started my journey. I sent a team and surveyed the impact and I followed up with a telephone survey. And then later in the year 2013, there were another EF5 tornado happened in, in Oklahoma more. And I also conduct a telephone survey to follow <coughs> to, to, to survey the situation. One of my papers is about that. So and after that, I gradually to receive grants from the National Science Foundation, from National Institutes of Standards and Technology to support my study. Now I, I'm collecting a longitudinal study on the survival of tornadoes, and I have already included three tornado, <coughs> tornadoes in the data set. One is a 2019 Dallas tornado, one is a 2020 Nashville Cro Crockville tornado, another is a 2021 Alabama tornado. And uh, our funding allow us to do a three-wave data collection. I think I'm very fortunate. We have finished the first wave of data collection. We are doing the second wave of data collection <coughs> and our plan is to finish the third wave data, collect data collection next year. It's exciting and very exciting because I just found that uh, when I bridge the gerontology and disaster research, there are so many new findings that people have never talked about. And uh, I think that is really could give some insights and guidance to the practitioners, you know, to let them know the different, you know, older adults is such a heterogeneous population and how they can use our research fundings to guide their practice. Okay, so that is about that. So let's just uh, <coughs> go to um, a very um, brief introduction now to what is a disaster. What is the difference between disaster and hazard? Anyone has some idea? Hazards, hazards and disasters. For example, tornadoes are happening every day, but not every tornado is a disaster because a tornado can happen somewhere no person is living, right? It happened, it is a hazard, that's it. But disaster is, a, is different. It is basically a kind of severe disruption that causes extensive human, material, economic, or environmental losses to a community or society that has conditions of vulnerability or lacks sufficient capacity to cope with consequences. So not every hazard is disaster, okay? Yeah, sometimes if, if something happens, it may not be a disaster at all if the society is pre has prepared enough. Like a tornado, <coughs> it may happen. But if every building is built so strongly that it can resist that and everyone has taken protective action, it's just a hazard, it is not a disaster. But when it starts to kill people, it just causes extensive losses, then that becomes a disaster. So for today's paper, the first two paper, I will talk about preparedness for disasters. And the third paper, I will talk about the health impact of tornadoes. Okay, let, uh, especially <coughs> the three papers I will discuss are all forthcoming. That means they have been accepted for publication, but they have not been formally published. So basically that is my recent, most recent and the list, latest um, uh, findings and publications. So I'm, it is my pleasure to present here. Many are presenting for the first time, <laughs> so, especially the first paper. <coughs> this, this paper just be accepted by the research on aging, but it could be a, a freely available online, it should already be available. First thing I will talk about, the topic of this paper is financial preparedness for disasters. As a disaster researcher, you know, disaster preparedness usually means that whether you have got enough supplies, whether you have made an emergency plan, but a very underdeveloped, understudied areas is financial preparedness for disasters. But actually, 
financial preparedness is very important because that if you are financially prepared, you will be ha- you will have resources to mitigate the impact. Like you can just uh, strengthen your building, you can buy preparedness kit. So that is very important, but it is typically an under understudied area. And recently, people found that there is a kind of cycle of poverty. That means disaster. Once disaster happens, people may come the, those low income, you know people from the low-income community are more likely to fall into poverty because they have been disadvantaged. And disaster will just give them even stronger disadvantage. So that will be the cycle of poverty. But if they are prepared financially, that will help them to from falling into poverty. So anyway, it is a very important topic, but very understudied. But luckily, we got the data to study that in the, with a national sample. And it is the first time for the national sample to include this measure. So we take this advantage to study the financial preparedness for disasters. People have a lot of argument about whether older adults are better prepared than younger adults. I see that that is basically is that people usually do not have a sufficient understanding about the heterogeneity among older adults. They regard older adults as a population, younger adults as a population. So there will be argument whether older adults are more prepared than younger adults. And so there are lots of conflicting evidence. Some people find older adults are more prepared, some, some find people are less prepared, some people find they just have no difference. But the problem is really about what you are measuring and which population you are working with. So I will not go into details, but my point is that <laughs> the average age differences could hide the disparities among older adults themselves. So that is what, as a gerontologist, that is our contribution to disaster research. We are very sensitive to this kind of heterogeneity. Actually, one of the important contributions of this paper, that is why I like this paper so much, is that I've developed, (coughs) I integrated several (coughs) perspectives, theoretical perspectives from disaster research and, and the gerontology and developed a multi-level layered vulnerability perspective. I think that is kind of contribution from a gerontologist to disaster research. The first perspective, social vulnerability perspective. This perspective is, pre, is dominating in disaster research and uh, because it recognized that some populations such, such for example, age, gender, income, race, ethnicity, this kind of thing will (coughs) make people more vulnerable to disaster. So this is a social vulnerability perspective. And from the the gerontology perspective, we know that when we talk about this quality uh, uh, disparities, there is a very famous cumulative advantage and disadvantage theory. It basically argues that disparities are exacerbated during older age. It accumulates this kind of disadvantage accumulate over, over life. So the disparities will increase at the older age. <coughs> Another important perspective is double, double jeopardy theory. <coughs> that basically means, <coughs> I'm sorry. For example, the older adults of some kind of special characteristics like, like in, low income minority status, they are more likely to be vulnerable. So this is called a double jeopardy. But as a gerontologist, we do not always see the older adults are vulnerable. We know that older adults have unique resources, coping strategies. <coughs> so that is what about the selection, optimization, and compensation theory. That basically recognize that older adults have some kind of special strategies to cope with stress and cope with the older age. <coughs> So this, this, this is a, related to another thing is that recently in disaster research, people started <coughs> to recognize the importance of layered <coughs> or intersectional vulnerability, uh, vulnerability. That means if someone is older and someone is of lower income, then this is called intersectional vulnerability. That is, they have multiple vulnerability that makes them more vulnerable. And that is individual, individual focused uh, theoretical perspective. And <clears throat> recently, people start to think that, to recognize the community resilience become a hot word, buzzword, community resilience, community vulnerability, because they recognize that 
vulnerability do not only exist at the individual level. So that is a so that is what encouraged me to think about the multi-level perspective. So I integrated all this kind of thing into a multi-level layered vulnerability perspective and recognize that people's vulnerability <coughs> are reflected at different levels and could exacerbate at the older age. So that is a so there are several <coughs> hypotheses. It's about the hypothesis, it's about the age difference. It is about, you know, older adults may be vulnerable, maybe more vulnerable, but it recognizes heterogeneity, like you know, um, those who are really who are of advanced age could be, be more uh, le uh, less prepared than the <coughs> 65 to 45 or uh, 40 uh, 74 age group. And H2 and H3 basically means older adults' vulnerability will be exacerbated by other individual vulnerabilities. And H3 means older adults' vulnerabilities will be vulnerabilities. So that, that is basically the hypothesis of this study. <coughs> we used a sample <coughs> from the National Household Survey conducted by the Federal Emergency uh, Management uh, Agency. And especially, th this is a national representative sample. They have a very large sample size. And to just to, to do the multi-level analysis, we match the data with a county-level social vulnerability index indicator based on the county. In which respondents were living with CDC developed the social vulnerability index, and as we can got the data from this um, uh, at the county level, it has five, <coughs> 50 indicators. That is what we have used for uh, today's <coughs> analysis. So altogether, uh, the data included more than uh, almost 5,000 for, for, for 4,600 respondents and from 958 counties. Our major dependent variable is uh, financial preparedness for emergency. It's a very simple question. Do you have money set aside for emergency? And our independent variable basically are individual level vulnerabilities, like age group. We separate them into four age groups with a reference that 65 to 74 is a reference group. We use this group because we want to see how this group differ is different from other age groups. And we also have Gender, uh, gender, race, ethnicity, education, home ownership, family size, having minor child, having disability, disaster experience, and uh, their poverty level uh, as individual level uh, factors. And for the community level, we have 15 indicators from the CDC's social vulnerability index, like community level of poverty, unemployment rate, per capita income, no high school diploma, age 65 above, age the 617 and lower, um, non-institutionalized population, single parent household, minority, speaking English less than well, crowded in it, uh, with multi-family households, um, uh, structure, um, percentage of mobile houses, and uh, crowdedness. Uh, no vehicles available in the institutionalized group order. So we use all these 15 um, indicators as indicators of community level vulnerability. So our analysis is pretty straightforward. We first do a main in impact to see whether there are age differences, and then we <coughs> interact the age group with individual level vulnerability indicators, and then we integrate the, the age group with a community level um, uh, indicators. And because the community level is a higher level, we use the multi-level analysis in this specific analysis, the two-level model, hierarchical linear uh, regression model. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so this is basically our major results. And uh, the first we found that, okay, other from this one, we found that those ages 65 to 75 well, actually, the, the one, <coughs> the age groups that are most likely to set money aside. So they are pretty most prepared. 
but uh, those 75 and above were less prepared than this group. So it is not, they, they were not necessarily less prepared than, than younger adults. And from this study, they were more prepared. But if we look deeper into individual level vulnerability, we found that among relatively advantaged groups, that is white and those with insurance, those aged 65 and 74 were more advantaged than those aged 18 and 44. That means among advantaged groups, older people are more advantaged than younger adults. But among the disadvantaged groups, namely Hispanics and those with minor children, those aged 64, five to 74, were more disadvantaged than those aged 18 to 44. That basically means if they, are, they have some other vulnerabilities, the older adults were less prepared than younger adults. So that just basically provides support to our hypothesis about this kind of layered vulnerability. So older adults are different, they're heterogeneous. If they are advantaged in other way, they are more advantaged than, than younger adults. But if they are disadvantaged in other way, they are even, they are even more disadvantaged than younger adults. So this is at an individual level. And then we found the same pattern <coughs> at the community level. That is, <coughs> those aged 64, uh, 65 to 74 were less prepared than those aged 18 to 44 in communities, in disadvantaged communities. That means communities with higher level of poverty, higher percentage of minorities, <coughs> and higher percentage of households with no vehicles. So basically that means in those disadvantaged communities, older adults are more, are less disadvantaged than younger adults. So that basically provides support to our layered multi-level, uh, multi-level layered vulnerability <coughs> perspective. Especially we found that the poverty at the community level, not the poverty at the individual level, contextualize age differences. This basically highlights that the older adults reliance on community, they are more reliant on community resources because we talked about the social emotion, <coughs> we talked about the selection, optimization and compensation theory. And it basically means that older adults could use more resources to compensate their loss. So they are more reliant on community resources. So these are basically the major results. So conclusion is that the, the, this is the major contribution of this study is a multi-level integration of social vulnerability perspective and theories of aging and the develop a kind of multi-level layered vulnerability perspective. And the funding, <coughs> the funding support the general hypothesis that vulnerabilities associated with older age could be aggravated by vulnerabilities at the individual and the community levels. So I think this will provide important um, guidance for pra practice for intervention uh, to target those older adults uh, in the disadvantaged communities and with some kind of certain characteristics. And we provide some empirical evidence about what kind of <coughs> characteristics could be most uh, um, just uh, damaging or just uh, could be just the uh, most uh, mostly disadvantaged older adults. Okay, so this is for the first study. The second study <coughs> is also forthcoming, but it may be available online, is to <coughs> barriers to prepare for disasters, age differences and caregiving are responsibilities. It was accepted by International Journal of Disaster Re uh, Risk Reduction. <clears throat> this one, uh, again, uses um, disaster-related perspective, like protection motivation theory that examines factors contributing to protective action and the life course perspective that recognizes differences in behaviors at different stages of the life course. So this study investigated age pattern of barriers to prepare for disasters. For this one, we specifically dig into the barriers to prepare for disasters. This, we also use the FEMA data. They have some kind of open-ended question and the people briefly <coughs> report their barriers. And then we just, um, we categorize their answers into different theoretical 
you know, concepts and then study the barriers for that. So, <coughs> and we also interesting because as a gerontologist, you know, caregiving is a big topic. So <coughs> I brought up the question about how caregiving responsibilities contextualize these kind of barriers uh, and how they interact with age. This is a protective action theory. So it tries to explain why some people take protective action, some people do not. The protective action can be defined in many ways. Like if you develop an emergency plan, that is a kind of protective action. If you <coughs> get some kind of supplies, emergency kit, that kind of protection action. And during the tornado, some people take protective action by sheltering in place. Some people do not take protective action. They just ignore the warning and stay where they are. So that is, so there's some differences and a lot of literature starting why some people do that, some people do not do that. And it has been used also <coughs> a lot in the healthcare. Some people use healthcare, some people do not. <coughs> some people take pre preventive measures, some people do not. And from this theory, there are, there are two types of important cognitive, cognitive process. One is called the threat of appraisal, or a general word is also called risk perception. How likely <coughs> they think that will happen, some risk will happen. How likely a tornado will happen, how likely a disaster will happen, and perceive the consequences. If this happens, how bad it will be. So that is generally called a threat appraisal or a risk perception. Risk perception is a big um, area of studying disaster research. People feel the risk, will do something. People do not feel the risk, will not do anything. <coughs> Another thing is called the coping appraisal. Coping appraisal basically means <coughs> perceive the self-efficacy. Means that whether they think they can do the, they can, they can, they can, can do the pre, the protect protective action well, and perceive the response efficacy and perceive the uh, response cost. So all these kind of things are <coughs> actually related to their capacity to take the protective action. Whether they have the money, ability to do that and whether do that will be effective. So that is, they, they, they define this as coping appraisal. So that is what this article <coughs> focused on. So this is a life course perspective. I think most of us are very familiar with this one. So this is the basis for why we argue people at different life stages will do things differently. And because of their life stage, they have different responsibilities, they have different priorities, so they have different uh, behaviors. <coughs> so, <coughs> so for the, it is interesting actually that in the United States, it, it was found that most caregivers are more prepared than non-caregivers. And actually in another paper I recently published, I studied the Asian American and other compared, compared them with other uh, race, <coughs> racial categories like white, African American, and uh, Native Indians, and I found that for all the other for all the other racial groups, caregivers are more prepared than non caregivers, but not for Asian caregivers. Asian caregivers is the only group <coughs> that is <coughs> less prepared than non caregivers, and we discussed the reason in, in another paper. But actually, caregiving. Um, substantially affected people's uh, preparedness behavior. So this is a theoretical framework that we think that family caregiving will affect the preparedness barriers because caregiving will take time from people, right? And that will, they, have, they will feel exhausted, they will have limited resources, so they will <coughs> be less prepared. And the age will be a moderator uh, for this one. You can see, um, because older caregivers could be more experienced than younger caregivers, um, both in caregiving and preparing for disasters. And the uh, caregiving could be a normal life event and fully expected at the older age. But the younger caregivers step into the role without sufficient mental preparation. So they may be disadvantaged in this way for younger um, caregivers. And the older family caregivers are more likely to focus on the positive aspect of caregiving better regulate and monitor internal emotions and distress and experience lower risk of anxiety than younger caregivers. So that has been found in some way because that is regarded as normal life events, 
more experienced. So as a result, older family caregivers <coughs> may be more <coughs> better prepared than younger uh, counterparts. So, so we, we just think because of this kind of life course perspective, we just expect that uh, the fam family caregiving will have very different impact in preparedness barriers among different age groups. So we have three hypotheses. <clears throat> Individuals of different age groups are different in their likelihood of having barriers to lead disaster preparedness, especially um, just the older adults with advanced age uh, would be more likely to encounter barriers. And uh, caregivers have a like, higher likelihood of encountering barriers to disaster preparedness. And the caregiver in responsibilities have a different impact on barriers to disaster preparedness among different age groups. So basically, it's a reiteration about the theoretical framework we have just um, talked about. Uh, this one <clears throat> used the 2017 uh, FEMA National Household Survey. And uh, we have more than 1,000 respondents uh, who answered the question about the barriers, because not everyone answered the uh, question about barriers. We, there is a kind of <clears throat> question. You can see that uh, participants who you, you know basically ask them it, uh, just how confident you <clears throat> you are in preparing for a disaster, and if they do not think they are very confident, then a probing question is asked: Is there a reason to think you will not be able to take the steps to prepare? And they actually gave the kind of exact text wording, and then we just. <clears throat> categorize those wordings into coping appraisal barriers when they were related to the lack of self-efficacy, a capacity to take action, the perception that preparedness was useless, or the inability to afford the cost. We, we think that this is a coping appraisal barriers. And we code those kind of saying, uh, <clears throat> like don't care, do not worry about disaster, into threat appraisal barriers when they were associated with risk perception or risk consequence. So actually, we just uh, separate people's text and um, uh, answers into these two type of barriers. So uh, then when we do the analysis. We use the age group as the uh, um, focal independent variable. And uh, we measure their caregiving as whether they are taking uh, care of older adults. and. Uh, um, and we also uh, just, uh, you know, kind of um, do an interaction between these two. We control for other variables. So you can see actually the result shows that, you know, uh, compared to the young, younger old, those aged, uh, you know, younger or, or more advanced age have a higher odds of having barriers or no barriers. So actually, it is still says that the, the, the group six, aged 65 to 75 is a group that has a least barrier. And the family caregivers more likely to report preparedness barriers because of you know, caregiving is challenging uh, the preparedness. And we also found there are significant interactions between caregiving and age. So it basically means that compared to young old caregivers, caregiving was associated with higher risk of having barriers among those in younger age and late middle age. So actually caregiving has been accepted as a normal life events by the, by the, uh, by the group of age, the 65 and the 74. Those who are really disadvantaged by caregiving responsibilities are the younger, <coughs> younger group and the late middle age group. That is, you can see the, um, the, the group uh, 18 to 34 and the group 50 to 64. They are the most uh, you know, disadvantaged. So we also found that, you know, compared to, uh, so, <clears throat> so the funny is pretty consistent in those, you know, people, of younger age or advanced older age, they have higher odds of having coping appraisal over, non uh, over no barriers. So this is a major, this is basically a major finding. 
So we found that actually, we found that we found significant age patterns in coping of pedal barrier. That means we do not find the risk perception is significantly different among different age groups. But we found across different age groups, people have very different uh, coping of pedal barriers uh, concerning how effective preparedness will be, con concerning how, um, but, but whether they have enough time and concerning whether they are able to prepare. So that makes, uh, that is, what the different differentiate different age groups. And then we actually found that um, those younger adults, if they have caregiving responsibility, they are they are less advantaged than the older adults because the older adults may have more experience in caregiving. So sometimes we have to really think about that. If younger adults step into the caregiving role, that will be additional, you know, additional burden on them and how to help them <laughs> in this way. So basically that is a major finding. So possibly different from the kind of stereotypical idea about older adults are more vulnerable, right? Older adults sometimes are more resourceful, but if they are of advanced older age, that is a different story. But when people are of 65 to 74 years old, they may still be very, you know, kind of at a time then they, they are able to, you know, hear, hear others and then they have experience, they are prepared. So they are not necessarily disadvantaged. But again, I want you to bring your attention to the heterogeneity among older adults, right? We talk about those ages 65 to 74 on average in this study. But with last study, we talked about, you know, different characteristics of older adults. I just guess those older adults, you know, of racial ethnicity, like I, I said, Asian American, okay? They are very disadvantaged. So that is a different story. We have to keep that in mind. Okay, so this is the second paper. Have I used all my time? <laughs> no problem, go ahead, you have time, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. So, <clears throat> going to the last paper. This is another paper just accepted several days ago. Uh, it's the health impact of tornadoes. Are older adults more resilient? This is a very straightforward question that I want to answer for a long time. Because from the very beginning of my study in this area, I, I'm struggling with this question. People always ask whether older adults are more resilient or whether they are more vulnerable than older adults concerning health impact. So that is what uh, I have done. And uh, <coughs> so, <coughs> So the research questions are very simple. I want to examine the health impact of tornadoes. And I want to see how older adults different from younger adults. Actually, <coughs> although this is a paper just accepted, I developed this paper several years ago. It is my early stage paper. And uh, the question is still about age differences, not looking to, you know, too much into the um, heterogeneity. And uh, the guiding perspective <coughs> is a resilience perspective. Okay. You know, for disasters, people always think after disasters, people will suffer. We talked about the post-traumatic stress. We talk about depression. We talk about anxiety. We talk about decline health. But, you know, in recent decades, there's another trend that people recognize. <clears throat> after the disasters, people can experience growth. That was measured by post-traumatic growth. So that is a resilience perspective. And Post-traumatic growth and post-traumatic stress or negative impact are not mutually exclusive. And in my earlier studies, I, always, I, I even found that they coexist. Co For those people who experience a lot of stress and some, sometimes they, you know, they just experience a lot of growth at the same time. So that's an interesting perspective. It's called the resilience perspective. The life perspective, like, like I saw, talked about it, that you know, older adults have some special <coughs> Um, you know, different life stages, priority, behaviors, health situations. So they are different from younger adults in <coughs> many ways. Another theory is a, a social emotional selectivity theory. That is one of the theories I like so much, I like best. It basically talk about when people get older, <coughs> they change their life priority. When we are young, we just value the kind of superficial relationship and value, we value information. We talk with people, we get to know a lot of people, we enjoy that because that will help us survive, right? We get a job referral, we got information collaborators, but when we get older, this becomes less important for us. We just start to value really those kind of key relationship, very deep relationship, long-term friends. We do not, you know, 
this is a hypothesis, right? <laughs> people are different, but uh, this is hypothesis just says people, when they get older, they start to value those kind of very close emotional re rewarding relationship, and then they stop searching for information or acquaintance. <clears throat> So this is not a theory guiding this research because different experiences of disaster will may mean different things. For example, financial losses may not be so important for older adults, right? <clears throat> they are material, they may not be so emotionally important, and that could be less impactful among older adults and younger adults. <clears throat> but like family members' <clears throat> relationship, this kind of thing could be more damaging. So from this perspective, I developed this study to see in which way are older adults more vulnerable and in which way older adults may be more resilient? Because there are so many dimensions we are talking about, even when we talk about health impact, there are many health and mental health outcomes we can think about, okay? We cannot just say there's one thing, you know, one fit or um, hypothesis. <clears throat> and for this particular study, I collect the data in the two tornadoes. One is a more tornado I just mentioned, and uh, it is uh, the third most expensive tornado. But not, possibly not because about we, we got another very expensive tornado just last year in December. So I need to double check. But uh, by the time of that time, it was the third most expensive tornado. And also <coughs> another Hattiesburg tornado, but they happened at a similar time. So we collected data in 2014, about one year later, use the telephone uh, survey. This is, you can see, this is basically before the tornado. Beautiful neighborhood, right? A lot of houses. The red one is a track of the EF5 track. <coughs> this is after the tornado. Can you see, still see the houses? All the houses are wiped away, you can see that. It's a very damaging tornado. And this is, you know, one year after the tornado, some recovery, some rebuilding, but still many empty lots. And this is just a three years of tornado, still experiencing the recovery process. Actually, one year after the tornado, I visited the field. I visited more uh, by myself and drive there. And this is elementary school. This elementary school killed several, several kids were killed during the tornado and the school was wiped out. This is a complete uh, reconstruction. And this is a story of a family. <coughs> They sit on the debris of their house. Their house was completely damaged, but they just uh, try to recover as a family and they just uh, post their story on the fence of the new school here. And see the, the, the Newton family, this family. <coughs> and this one is actually, I don't know whether you know what it is, this kind of shining, the, the, the metal, the, the metal, this one. It actually, it is a shelter. After the tornado, people start to, you know, to, to, to build basement, to build shelter, so they can, look, they can shelter once the tornado happened. Actually, Moor is a very risky place to live in. They have experienced several EF5 tornadoes in the past several decades. And Oklahoma is the, the, the area that experienced the most tornadoes, most damaging tornadoes. And so this is a new construction about the shelter. So, <clears throat> So this is the data. We have about you know, <coughs> 500 cases. And for this data collection, I intentionally oversampled older dogs to be about half of the sample. <coughs> and uh, I used a variety of outcomes. We, I used a self-reported health change that is relative to uh, your health before the tornado. Your current health was better declined or no change, no change in the reference group. I also measured the post-traumatic distress and the growth. Because I was still include a lot of questions, I used a very simple six item to measure post-traumatic di distress. And I used a short form of post-traumatic growth inventory to measure post-traumatic growth. And there are several different experiences of tornado. The first one is how stressful the tornado experience was to you. Not how not at all stressful to most stressful thing you can imagine. And the financial losses, no loss to all you had. And damage from non, no damage to destruction, all walls collapsed, the whole house is gone. And we also take 
take the family perspective into this and uh, whether family members experienced any decline in physical health and mental health. I think this family level analysis is the most, most understudied area because people usually focus on individual community, but this family has not been really focused. And that is what I want to bring to this study. So control the whole bunch of variables <clears throat> for different outcomes. We use the different analysis, but of course it is regression in general. For the self-rated health, we do not find a significant difference uh, between age groups concerning their self-reported uh, group. Most people report no change. Some people a little bit report improved, a little bit improved. Uh, reported decline, but most of that says no change and no age differences. <clears throat> and for the distress, we found some significant differences between, uh, uh, between age groups. Uh, about the old, older adults seem to experience less distress than younger adults, but no significant difference between age groups concerning the post-traumatic uh, post um, growth. Then we just find that the impact of stressful experience. Uh, we found that stressful experience was associated with declined health among younger, but not older adults. And this difference was statistically significant. So it seemed that older adults are more robust to stressful experience. They may be able to handle stressful experience better. So it seems that they are more resilient in this way. And the financial losses, we found that Financial losses sometimes are associated with improved health among older, but not younger adults. So some kind of, you know, kind of people become stronger when they have some loss. And actually I found in another study that losses are, is a very strong predictor of post-traumatic growth. When people get more losses, they are more likely to have some kind of psychological growth to realize they have new priority in life and have some kind of spiritual growth. So it seems that older adults are more robust to financial losses. And the psychological um, distress, we found that family members declined the mental health was associated with higher psychological distress among older adults but younger adults. So you can see that family members, this kind of relationship, family members' mental health, so older adults tend to be more vulnerable to family members' mental health. So this provides some support to the social emotional selectivity theory, what's the real value, and the difference was statistically significant. So there are other interesting results. I will not go into that because they are not uh, um, focused, fo fo focal to the um, the re re results, but if you are interested, you may look for the paper, have a look. <coughs> so, <coughs> so the discussion is basically, we found that, you know, older adults and younger adults, they are resilient to different things, they are more vulnerable to different things. So that provides support to the life course perspective. And then it also provides support to the social emotional selectivity theory. It means older adults have some special, you know, resources, but they're especially vulnerable to a certain thing. So the empirical findings could be, again, used to, to guide uh, practitioners working with older adults to know their special vulnerability. I think that's it, and uh, I'm done. So basically, what I have done is to integrate theories of aging and disaster research, and I'm very excited about that, and just found that I have I, there's a lot I can do. And I believe with my fundings sometime, someday will help some people. So very exciting. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Professor Tong. Uh, okay, uh, let us, uh, uh, let us uh, have uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, who have questions, please uh, uh, raise your hand. Uh, we have time. Uh, yes, Hong Wei, please go ahead. Oh, hi, um, hi, Professor Chung. Very, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, big fan of your research on intergenerational, intergenerational re relationships. So I was uh, so surprised much. to see that you're working on disaster because uh, I also recently uh, started reading about uh, 
post-traumatic uh, growth theory. And uh, I'm also thinking about uh, integrating aging into environmental uh, disasters. So I have a question about the first study you, 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 you analyzed. Um, I, I'm curious how you, I guess because of cross-sectional data, you may not be able to do that in our first study, but I, I just, I'm just curious to hear about your, your thoughts uh, on how to uh, tease out the cell selection into uh, a neighborhood with high politics. Because we know, you know, individuals or families with low SES um, may 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 have make, may not be able to afford like a better neighborhood, uh, and uh, which in turn leads into a concentration of poverty uh, geographically. So um, that's a kind of typical selection bias in multi-level, you know, uh, study in the U.S. Uh, so whether it is uh, individual families who cannot afford like uh, buying flood insurance or you know like uh, better uh, how, uh, home insurance and therefore they would have trouble uh, financially uh, in you know rebuilding their home or relocating to a better neighborhood after disaster. So how can you tease out the you know the, the selection components into the like, like the kind of first study you, you, you shared today. Yeah. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, <clears throat> for this study, um, people, you know, um, we basically <coughs> focus on how this kind of um, higher level, you know, exacerbate the individual level of vulnerability. Here, um, I think that uh, um, I think you have a very good point here that people may self, you know, not self-select or may be forced to live in this community, right? So that is, is actually our point is that living in those kind of communities will further exacerbate their vulnerability, right? They basically have no choice to go to other communities, so they stay in communities that are really disadvantaged, and that makes them even more disadvantaged. So that 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 is a point we try to make here. So we have not, uh, you know, so we have not addressed this kind of selection thing, but want to point out that uh, living in those kind of disadvantaged communities further aggregated the problem. So, so that is basically, especially we talked about like in, uh, in communities with no vehicle access, right? The higher percentage of no vehicle access that exacerbated <laughs> older adults, you know, disadvantages in preparing. So that is, could be some kind of practice practical importance for people to think about, you know, whether providing some kind of transportation thing will help to mitigate the negative impact. The, the negative impact has been there because they are, you know, they have no choice. But how we, what we can do to address the characteristics of the community, for example, to pro, for example, from the empirical study of this study, we found that you can see that, um, with uh, no vehicles, higher percentage of no vehicles, then what we can do. And we also know that those people, <coughs> older adults living in higher level of poverty, <coughs> have, <coughs> you, <coughs> I'm sorry, even more disadvantages. And what we can do, and the, like the community level of poverty, how, what we can do to re re reduce the, you know, community level poverty. And also from empirically from this study, we found among those indicators, the higher percentage of minority is also kind of factor that aggravated older adults disadvantage. And what we can do in this way, I have not, I, I do not have answers because I think that is a very complicated thing. And like, you know, self-selection, like the minority, like an Asian, like to living neighborhoods with more Asian, right? The Hispanics may be more likely to live in communities in, in the, uh, with more Hispanics. Then this, <coughs> This present a problem. What can policy makers to, to address this kind of question? That is more like a question I propose, not a kind of solution I, I, I can give. So thank you very much for the question. And for the <coughs> study itself, I think the data, uh, from the data quality perspective, I think that this data quality, um, I would say that 
it will, you know, like all the survey, it suffers from response rate or whatever. And we consulted with FEMA and the FEMA admitted that the response rate is very low. <clears throat> but they have tried to mitigate this kind of problem by making the survey with two languages, like um, <coughs> English and Spanish. So that basically in, make it better to uh, you know, reach out to those disadvantaged minority population. And because they have resources, they just made the numerous calls and because they are FEMA and got um, kind of credentials. So I think the data quality <coughs> is not so bad, but of course we are working with limitations. But I, I really appreciate your question about this one. Um, but that, that definitely is a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions? <coughs> Apuk, please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoy your talk and learn quite a bit. Um, in your study, I have two questions. My first question is whether in your, you know, these st studies that you did based on FEMA data, as well as your own data set, do you look into, um, you know, older adults who have very limited um, uh, social networks, for example, people who may live alone, how they respond to um, uh, disaster, as well as how well prepared they are uh, to this kind of disaster. And my second question is related to, um, you know, this whole, I mean, I don't know a whole lot about this literature, right? So do you find, uh, based on your studies and your literature review, do you see any differences in how you know, older persons in the U.S. Uh, responds to disaster compared to, um, say, you know, older adults elsewhere, like in Asia, in developing settings. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. The first one is that uh, um, for the older adults, social connections, let me think, think that. Uh, <coughs> People who live alone. Who, okay, yeah. Um, both the data set I have used, I use the, I think, a kind of trying to get a representative sample from the community. So it is not specifically focusing on older adults living alone. But in my data set, I did include the number of family members. And I think that could be a very interesting question to address about that. And the uh, social network is important, uh, very important part for social older adults. And uh, we definitely, you know, uh, include that. And uh, I think that could be my next paper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, um, and especially in my, I, in my new data collection, I include the living arrangements. I think that is a very, because my part, my original interest in gerontology focused a lot to, of, on living arrangements. That is a definite question I want to address, but have not got, uh, you know, an opportunity to write anything about that. But it is a part of, of the multi-level layered vulnerability perspective, right? Living alone is a kind of uh, vulnerability, of course. And for the <coughs> second question, <coughs> I focus on the disasters in the United States. I have not compared that with other countries, but I do have published recently comparing Asian American with other races. And uh, in those kind of studies, I discussed about why Asian, uh, Asian, you know, Asian American are different from uh, other races, and one reason is that Asian American actually is a is a subgroup with the highest percentage of immigrants. It's about seventy eight percent of something, seventy to eighty percent of Asian American are immigrants. So that makes them be in a very special situation about disaster preparedness. And in my paper, I also discussed about some 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 Asian, you know, they have. Asian American is really a heterogeneity group. Again, it has a, about a dozen, more than a dozen origins. And from someone from South Asia, someone from <coughs> East Asia, and they are very different. And some, some, some subpopulation came to the United States with a lot of disaster preparedness knowledge because they are in a region that uh, experienced disasters repeatedly, right? So they are more prepared, but some, <coughs> Asian American immigrants from other countries, they may have like from China, they may just, uh, sometimes they are more likely to think disaster preparedness is a government 
issue. It's not individual issue. So it is more like, so it is very different. I, I discussed this kind of heterogeneity among the Asian groups and uh, but have not really um, compared other countries. But I'm very excited about my that branch of research because <clears throat> overall, I do not find the significant differences between Asian American and other races in disaster preparedness. But if you if you look into the caregiving responsibilities, that is different. And I also found recent paper, I also try to explain the differences. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, if you control the self-efficacy, there's no difference between Asian American and other races. So I, then I developed a paper into explaining the differences between Asian and other races. And I found that self-efficacy Self-efficacy is really one very important reason that explains why Asian Americans are less prepared than other races. The self-efficacy basically means how confident they are that you know they can prepare. And I think that Asian Americans in some way lack this kind of confidence because sometimes it's because of kind of isolation from the men, uh, men culture and uh, even Asian American sometimes was even less prepared than native Indians. They, they have been living there for a long time. They have some of their culture, inheritance of disaster prepared knowledge from their generations and generations of knowledge. But uh, <coughs> Asian America usually, because most of them are immigrants, so they may just have disadvantage in this way. And there's not a community mechanism, very well developed community mechanism to communicate disaster related knowledge and preparation, you know, kind of knowledge. So that is a problem. So I think this is fascinating. I think it's a very good question. I do not have answer to that, but I just try to relate to some studies I have done. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Oh, sure. Can you be uh, uh, quickly? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Professor. I really enjoyed the talk. I wanted to ask a little bit about the um, uh, post-traumatic growth um, and also whether Meaning making plays a big part because uh, when I was doing the literature review, we talked a lot about how meaning making contributes a lot to post traumatic growth and how in this elderly population that was discussed. The second question is Are there nuances, right, in all your studies around the type of disaster? If it's a tornado versus an earthquake, you know, um, is there a difference in how the elderly respond? And also, just these two questions, thank you. Okay. Uh, so may I just double check? The first question is about how the meaning making uh, in the uh, post-traumatic in older adults uh, experience, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. The second question is how tornado is compared to other disasters, right? Yeah, in people's responses and vulnerabilities and post-traumatic growth outcomes here. Okay, um, I will try my best to address. <laughs> um, but I think that possibly uh, just to try my best, okay? So, um, because uh, yep. I think the meaning making is a very important, um, very important topic in the post traumatic growth. And the old, older adults, like I said, like the social emotional selectivity theory, basically, I think older adults may, may be ad advantaged in this way. They just uh, may make it, you know, kind of relate to their spiritual. Because in the post traumatic growth scale, one question is to find a new priority of your life. And uh, <clears throat> just to find people are friendly, this kind of thing. So I think because of older adults' life experience and because of their um, value more about emotional rewarding relationship. And uh, I just think that uh, um, older adults are sometimes more likely to experience post-traumatic growth. <laughs> that is, if I'm just doing some studies, will be my hypothesis based on, you know, kind of, general understanding, but of course there will be some kind of detailed literature review we will address whether it is empirically supported. The okay. first question. The second question, um, tornado response to post-traumatic growth. I did, I did do one study about this one, <coughs> um, <coughs> but I'm not compared this with other, uh, I, just for this tornado, I found that the financial loss is a very strong predictor for post-traumatic growth. And actually, I used the latent class analysis in that, in that study. Uh, <clears throat> the major predictors to develop a typology, I remember may include post-traumatic growth and the post-traumatic stress. And I identified three groups. If I remember clearly, one group is those experienced the high traumatic growth and the high 
post-traumatic stress. And the financial loss is a, one of the most important predictor to being in this category. That is, if you're all together, high uh, psychological, uh, high growth and the high stress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank thank you. you for your question. Uh, uh, Professor Tong, uh, although we don't have much time, but I uh, would like to make a very brief comment on one very quick question. Uh, this is a very important uh, research question, uh, particularly the field of uh, gerontology, uh, studying uh, older people in crisis and disaster, a uh, very new and important given uh, the recent uh, COVID-19. Uh, this is a very important studies. I just have very two quick questions uh, seeking for a very brief answer. Uh, the very first question is uh, the first question, a uh, research paper on emergency, is that specifically refer to natural emergency or does it also consider about medical emergency, which is not necessarily natural or social? So that's uh, one, my first question. Second question is, uh, uh, so I know that uh, for uh, places, uh, you know, attacked by tornado in America, uh, usually there's uh, public and uh, business uh, environment for provide some kind of insurance or government uh, welfare program. So how these uh, uh, could be considered into the research as context? Yeah. Okay. Well, the first, the first question, I think is a very good question. Actually, um, the, the, we, did, we discussed in our limitation about the measure we are using. The question we asked is whether you set aside money for emergencies. It basically means any emergency and also relate to the COVID-19 situation. Hmm. But this specific item is asked in the context about the FEMA's National Household Survey of Disaster Preparedness. So hmm. people may just relate that more to disaster, but the question itself is about any emergency. I see. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so the second question is, uh, so how how about the places with high probability of, of having tornado, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, the public program or market insurance, all these kind of uh, micro contacts, you know, how it could be addressed. Yeah. Uh, I was addressed from two ways. Um, mm. The first is that, um, I would see that the social historical context are very important for people's behavior. Mm -hmm. So the government have to be fully realized that the, the, the differences in different places. For example, I also collected data in 2011, Joplin tornado and Tuscaloosa tornado. Joplin is a place that has not experienced a lot of tornadoes, mm -hmm. but it really experiences that EF5 tornado that killed so many people. And Tuscaloosa experienced a lot of tornadoes. So they respond mm -hmm. very differently to a tornado warning. Tuscaloosa, once they receive warning, they just take protective action immediately. Mm. You do not need to give them a second warning, they just take action. Mm. But in dropping, you have to warn them several times. So that means you have to have multiple um, warning received, then they will start to take action. So, that, so people, government have to be very um, sensitive to this kind of, you know, kind of background, historical background, their past experience of tornadoes. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> So um, another one I want to mention is actually I recently um, separated the disasters into two types. Mm -hmm. One is called a rapid onsite disaster, like tornado, wildfire, earthquake. Mm -hmm. For this kind of tornado <coughs> disasters, you have very short warning lead time. Tornado is 13 minutes on average. So you have only 13 minutes to decide what you do to save your life. But there are a different, another different type of tornado like hurricane, right? like hurricane, like a heat wave, this kind of thing. That has been given several days of warning, right? So you can prepare in the long. Wow. So I separate this into two, this, two, <coughs> two types and uh, examine people's preparedness behavior for this you know, kind of disasters and how people, people's behavior are different. And then we found it is very interesting that, um, you know, <coughs> the kind of response efficacy, that is their confidence in how to prepare is especially important for people who are exposed to this kind of <coughs> short lead time disasters like tornadoes. Mm -hmm. So I think people, the government and the agencies should be really aware about what kind of disasters their region is exposed to and know that their people's res you know, response will be different from other regions. Know their, yeah. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, that's very helpful. Uh, uh, <laughs> please join me uh, to thank Professor Chong again for the wonderful presentations. And thank you everyone to participate our uh, seminar and hope to see you again. Thank you very much. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you. Yeah, bye bye, bye, -bye. Professor Song. Yeah. Bye, thank you. Yeah.